action. Yes. All right. Good evening, everybody. Everybody's awake and hopefully half sober anyway. Um, real quick administrative announcement. I've been asked to uh, ask you guys to remind you there's no flash photography allowed anywhere inside the arena, especially when I'm talking. Just kidding. Um, thank you guys for attending the talk. Start a little bit about me real quick. My name is John Sammons, and I teach digital forensics at Marshall University in Huntington, West Virginia. Um, besides from teaching, I also write a little bit. I've written a book called The Basics of Digital Forensics by Singress. Oops, my laptop's moving. Uh, the, basics by, uh, the Basics of Digital Forensics by Singress. I've also contributed a chapter or two uh, to some other books. Uh, you're probably looking at the bullet where it says, I spent the 90s buying hookers and crack. That's probably drawing some attention. Um, I did, but I got paid for it because I was a police officer, so that wasn't, uh, so don't, don't panic. And then I'll also play some drums and do a little fly fishing. All right, so where, why am I here today? I want to talk about some real forensics. I want to talk about real forensics, not the stuff that you see on TV. We've been inundated with CSI everything. Well, that's not, that's not real. I want to talk about some real stuff. There's no sunglasses and hummers in there, all right? There certainly aren't any hummers or sunglasses in that. Now, this is your... This is your standard indigenous North American pedophile residence, all right? So not a whole lot of sexy going on in there, all right? There's your, the uh, bloody iPod. So enough about that. What I want to talk about is uh, first, I want to run through and define what forensics actually is. Then I want to talk about some of the characteristics of digital evidence. Talk about some of the principles and procedures that we use in digital forensics. And then lastly, I want to run through a couple of resources that I think would be helpful for you guys. So let's talk about what exactly is forensics and why is it important to you. All right, Forensics is nothing more than the combination of science and the law. It could be biological science, uh, DNA, anything like that. In, in this instance, it's obviously computer science. So we're going to take the law and combine it with the science. We're going to solve a legal problem with that methodology. Why is that important to you guys? Well, a few reasons. One is incident response. Okay, incident response, it plays in there, I think, a good bit more than what you, you may think. Uh, because regardless of what we're doing, we want an accurate result. We want an accurate result. So what forensic protocols and procedures allow you to do is to adequately determine and, rec and reconstruct what exactly, ha what exactly happened. Uh, determine the origin of the breach, how much of your information was breached, perhaps. How did they get in, et cetera. E-discovery. How many of you guys are familiar with what electronic discovery is? A few of you guys are, probably so. All right, huge, huge, huge thing, I think. You guys agree, disagree? Huge thing, not so much, sort of. Yeah, pain, painful, absolutely painful. Uh, when the, when the e-discovery boom first hit, a lot of the response initially was don't allow the in-house guys to do it. The lawyers did not want the in-house guys to touch it because primarily of a, of a um, perceived bias you might have, especially if something went off the rails and something were to happen to that evidence, and the, the in-house IT guy was the one that handled it, did they have motive to make sure that evidence never saw the court? Well, arguably, that's, that's a possibility or one theory the other side could throw in front of the jury. Well, if you guys have, have probably paid for outside electronic discovery vendors, it was probably pretty expensive, was it not? A lot, a lot of those costs are, are pretty off the hook. Now the pendulum is swinging a little bit back towards the in-house guys, at least taking a first swing at it in a lot of instances. So this is also where digital forensics comes into play. Because uh, regardless whether it's criminal or civil litigation, the same forensic principles and rules apply. You know, for the, the rules of admissibility and the rules of evidence are pretty much the same. Pretty much the same whether it's in criminal court or civil court. Administrative investigations. This is not uh, anything that rises t to the level of maybe a crime or maybe he's not even involved in litigation yet, but it may be just a, uh, a violation of company policies. One of the things that comes to my mind was the a few years back, you guys may have remembered the, uh, the big Securities and Exchange Commission controversy where they had a lot of their uh, top-level folks were watching pornography for over eight hours a day while they were drawing their six-figure salary. So they actually investigated those guys using digital forensics and uh, took appropriate action there. All right, let's talk about a couple of different characteristics that I want you to, this is one of the primary things to take away from this. Digital evidence is fragile. One thing you have to get your head around is from a forensic standpoint is that digital evidence is extremely volatile, extremely fragile. It can be modified even without, you know, human interaction, backup tape routines, antivirus, those kinds of things, uh, while common and, and uh, encouraged in the IT side. 
have to be accounted for on the forensic side because it's going to modify that metadata and you've got to account for why that file was changed. It may not be relevant as far as what the investigation focuses on, but courts, okay, are really, really concerned with um, making sure things are as they were. And this comes back from traditional evidence, blood, DNA, guns, all that stuff. They don't like to see things change. Now, obviously, this is a huge problem with us because technology is, is way outpacing the, you know, the legal side. And they are wrestling with this in an unbelievable fashion. The lawyers don't understand, by and large. The judges, a lot of them really don't understand. I actually was uh, last week speaking to all the West Virginia magistrates, and that was, that was a really interesting talk. A lot of them were really trying, but a lot of them were way out of their, their field of expertise. So and that's part of the challenge is a lot of these folks that are the triers of fact that are actually making the decisions in these cases don't understand enough about the evidence they're either excluding or admitting. So that gets to be a real problem. And that's one thing that we're trying to address at Marshall. And a, lot, and a lot of universities across the United States are trying to help the, the judiciary and the bar bring, bring the skill set up a little bit so they understand that that printed off email is not the evidence. That printed email is not the evidence. That word document is the evidence. Those, those ones and zeros, that's the evidence. Everywhere. A lot of times you'll think that you know, there's multiple copies of these things flying around. You guys all know that, that uh, hit that magic send button on the email. That email could be everywhere and anywhere. Okay, Mobile devices, servers, home machines, you name it, it could be anywhere. So you've got to account for all the different locations where that evidence could be. So don't get tunnel vision and think that's the only place I have to identify it and preserve it and collect it. Okay, Or if I'm looking for it and can't find it, think where else that thing might be. So that's one other thing to ponder. Some of the principles. Some of the principles as far as uh, forensics goes. This is Dr. Lacard back in the early 1800s. His name is Henry Lacard. And uh, he came up with this idea called Lacard's Exchange Principle. And this goes back to, to, to uh, forensic science from, from the get-go. And basically what he said was when every, time, every time a perpetrator enters and leaves a crime scene, they're going to bring something with them and they're going to take something out. They're going to bring something in and they're going to take something out. The question is, do we have the scientific ability to be able to identify and detect it, analyze it, collect it, so, so forth. Uh, we all know, let's say, DNA, hair, fiber, shoe impressions, fingerprints. That's easy to understand. I walk into a crime scene, I leave a shoe print on the floor, I leave a bloody thumbprint on the kitchen sink. Okay, then I, when I leave, I might take some carpet fiber with me, or I may take some of the victim's blood on my shoe. Okay. Well, that doesn't, uh, it does not apply, or do, does not not apply in the digital world. Same thing happens. Same thing with, with ones and zeros, bits and bytes. When that intruder breaches your network, they've got to get it in there somehow. They're going to egress some way. So there's going to be, in all likelihood, some, some artifact left behind of their uh, activity. So this is one principle that applies equally, I think, as far as the physical world and the computer world. You got to know those forensic commandments, and then you got to know when to sin, especially on this side of it, because there are forensic commandments that are never ever broken with blood and DNA and those things. But we're quickly finding out, and forensic science is wrestling with uh, the digital side because technology is so fast and so unstable, if you will, that it, it doesn't that, that what's accepted today and taught to the judges today could not apply tomorrow. For example, we'll get into that here in a minute as far as the uh, live system versus dead system response. For the longest time, and it's still going on today, is uh, a lot of it, law enforcement agencies still still um, prescribe when you encounter a running machine, what's the response? They tell you to pull the plug. Simply yank the plug out of the machine, and it's all good. But what happens to all the evidence that's in RAM? It's gone. All right, where does a lot, a lot of malware has got to be in RAM, right? There could be volatile artifacts from, let's say, chat programs in RAM. So by yanking the plug, it's now not quite the, the good alternative we once thought it was. Okay, And that's one evolution that's happening that even the law enforcement agencies are resisting a little bit. So that's one kind of a, a thing we have to watch out. So you've got to know when to sin. You've got to know when to sin. One of the tenets of digital forensics is you never want to analyze the original. You never want to analyze the original. We always want to make a copy. Okay. Always want to make a copy, which is it's a forensic clone. It's a bitstream image. In other words, it's every one and every zero on that physical piece of media. 
Copy and paste is not the same thing. Copy and paste is not the same thing. <laughs> All right. Got to protect that evidence. Always thinking about protecting the evidence. Got to be for, uh, the forefront of your mind. Protecting that evidence from um, static electricity, from um, natural disasters like water, fire, those kinds of things, um, from being written to. Integrity. Again, we talked about this a minute ago, was about the integrity of the evidence is paramount. It's everything. You have to make sure the courts want to see that that evidence is the same as it was when it was collected. It has to be the same. It has to be the same. Maintain a chain of custody. You've got to maintain that chain of custody. The courts want to know, in order for determined uh, to allow that evidence in the court, that evidence has to be shown to be in someone's care, custody, and control from the time it was found until the time has been presented in court. So every step along the way from the crime scene, who found it, who collected it, okay? Who then took it to the uh, evidence repository or the vault? Who secured it there? Who got it out of the vault and then started their analysis? Who put it back in the vault once the analysis was begun? And then who took it out of the vault to take it to court? You can see on and on and on. All that stuff has to be painstakingly documented. If this stuff is not documented, that evidence will never make it to court. Will never make it to court. If that chain of custody is broken, it will not make it to court. Documentation is critical. You guys may have heard this old tired saying, but if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. Absolutely true in digital forensics or forensic science, period. Whether it's civil or criminal, you got to take those notes, you got to document everything the best you can. A good way to do that is chronologically date and time, who did what, who, what, why, when, where, and how, and write that down. <clears throat> you can also take photographs, notes, videos, diagrams, reports, whatever, different ways of documenting things. For example, you, when you start collecting evidence, okay, you want to start out wide and then bring it in closer. You want to put that particular evidentiary item in context with the rest of the crime scene. Here in this picture, you've got the laptop computer on the table, but you want to put it in context of the bigger room to see where it actually was. Because when and if that eventually goes to court, you're going to be painting a picture. You'll be painting a picture along with the attorney of what happened, what you saw, what you did. You're going to try and transport the jury from that box to that scene three years ago. So these, these pictures and these notes are critical to help transport them and also critical to refresh your recollection because you're going to, probably going to be busy between the three years ago when you did this to where it went to court, right? So you're, you may have forgotten some details, so this documentation helps. You want to record those serial numbers and identifying numbers, serial numbers, service tag numbers, models, and so forth. Do that with notes and also photograph it. Let's talk about some of the procedures here a bit. Forensic clone, that bitstream image, every one and every zero from that piece of media. Again, we don't ever want to use or analyze the original unless there is a really good reason and we are able to justify why we did it. When you're making those clones, one thing you don't want to do is, is use a, when you, you take your target hard drive, the one you're going to clone, I'm sorry, your source drive, and you're going to clone it to a target hard drive. The one you're going to clone it to, all right, that needs to be forensically clean. That needs to be forensically clean and documented that it's clean. So what you don't want to have happen is you mix somebody's uh, peanut butter with somebody's chocolate, all right, because you start to commingle those ones and zeros from another case, and I've seen this happen almost in one case we were on that... Uh, the other side brought their forensic folks, uh, who was a tech. He didn't really understand the whole evidentiary process. And he comes in with a box full of old hard drives he's going to use to clone the machines to. So that was going to be a problem. All right? Use a write blocker. We always want to make sure we prevent us interacting with that original evidence, again, if at all possible. There are certain devices out there called write blockers that prevent your machine from actually writing to that drive. And that's one thing you want to have in place. I mentioned this a little while ago, that live system versus dead system. Uh, we talked about the plus is, yeah, you're not going gonna to be able to yank the plug and say, yeah, I didn't touch anything other than pulling the plug, and that's awesome. But the downside is, yeah, I yanked the plug and I lost all the evidence that was in RAM. I have no idea what was there. It may have only lived in RAM, so I'm going to miss all that stuff out. Plus, I may have caused some kind of horrific crash. I may have corrupted a database. I may have compromised it in some other way. The other side to that also is, have I been trained? Have I been trained to be able to do those things, to be able to collect that evidence out of memory and all that stuff? So there's also, there's, it's, it's a lot of moving pieces, if you will, to this. You've got to mark the evidence. 
part of that chain of custody again is we want to be able to identify it three years later that this is the hard drive that I collected. This is the thumb drive that I collected or the CD that I collected. Well, how do I know that? Because I have written my initials, the date, and a case number on it. And they'll present that to you in court, and you can say, yes, that's my initials, and these are my, that's my handwriting. <clears throat> Excuse me, you want to package the evidence. Okay, that's going to do a couple things. One, packaging it is going to keep it secure. Okay, it's going to help uh, maintain the integrity of the evidence. It's also going to keep it safe. Here's an example of an evidence bag that we've got. Notice up there you've got that evidence tape at the top, that little red line. That's some pretty cool stuff. You guys can buy this at your local crime scene shop. <laughs> uh, that basically it's tamper proof. You cannot get into that bag. You, you don't, it's not? No, not at all. Really? It's meant to be tamper evidence, and tamper evidence is not tamper proof. But also the tamper evidence is very, very limited. If you want to know more, tamper right. evidence context. Absolutely. I'd love to see that. After. Absolutely. All right, we're going to make a good faith attempt. All right, all right, we're going to make a good faith attempt that we've tried to, to seal that evidence up. All right, how do we verify the integrity of the evidence? How do we know that that, let's say, because we've made our clone, right? We've cloned that hard drive. Because what happens with you guys out there in the field? If you get, let's say, an e-discovery, let's say, a, a, um, a preservation order, and you've got to go out and you've got to preserve the CEO's laptop or his, hard, or his uh, desktop computer, you're not going to probably be able to take that machine out of service. You're probably going to want to clone it and then put it back. You may do, may have to do that for for uh, for reasons out of your control. So how does how do we how do we take that clone since it's not it's a copy? It's not the original. And for court purposes, we always want they always want the original. Always want the original. You can't take a picture of the bloody knife and bring it to court. You got to bring the bloody knife. So how do we do that with the hard drive? Well, we do that through the magic of hash values. All right, do that through the magic of hash values, hashing algorithms. These hash values are like uh, digital fingerprints or digital DNA. You might have heard the term SHA-1, MD-5, uh, SHA-2, SHA-256. All those hashing al algorithms are what we use to verify the integrity of the evidence to show that that copy is the exact same as that original. Now, there's hash collisions. You guys have probably heard of that. But on the order of uh, MD-5. For example, there's a 1 in 340 billion, 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 billion chance that you're going to get two different uh, hash values for the same piece of evidence. All right. Identify all the potential sources. We talked about that just a little bit. Um, sense of urgency. It goes back to that, that digital evidence is volatile. Digital evidence is volatile. Especially if you're, you're all, another thing besides the volatility of the evidence itself is if you're going for anything that is held by a service provider be a cloud provider, it could be a social media provider. They've got document retention destruction policies that are going to be uh, in play. But normally they could be between 15, 30, 60, 90, 120 days that they'll keep certain types of this data and then they're going to purge it. So if you don't act with some kind of haste to secure that stuff, it's going to be gone. Mobile devices are a big problem. Mobile devices are a big problem. Um, you've got to shield those things. You've got to shield these mobile devices. One of the, one of the, Two ways here, that bottom thing is a Faraday bag. It's a Faraday bag, that, uh, and the top thing is nothing more than a, a, a paint can. That's the field expedient paint can, all right? Uh, you can also wrap it up a, 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 as much aluminum foil as you can find and hope for the best. Uh, that's another way to do it. But you want to shield that because they can be wiped remotely, all right? And then also if it's constantly receiving data from the tower, what's going on with the data on the, on the device? It's changing, right? So you want to, we want to stop that from happening. Solid state drives are the devil. Solid state drives are the devil. They're the kryptonite to the forensic superpowers. As of right now, there's some pretty significant problems with that. The, 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 the bread and butter of forensics forever has been able to recover that deleted data. Solid state drives are making, are making that, uh, are taking that off the table as of now. So that's a massive problem. So be aware. If you've got solid state drives under your control and you need to preserve the data, when those things are powered up, things are bad things are happening. Secure evidence storage. Sticking it in a cardboard box in the bottom of your drawer is probably not going to count as secure uh, storage. All right? You need to make sure that it's somewhere where there's limited access, where that you can document who's been in and out of there and those kinds of things. Anything that the opposing party can use to throw stink on that to say, well, how do you know somebody did not get in there? You don't know because it was in your drawer, unlocked, in the office, it was wide open that everybody had access to 24-7, 365. That gets to be a problem. Training and certifications. If you're going to use the forensic tools and do these things, 
for court purposes and for practicality, you need to be trained and have some certifications to back you up. Use validated tools. What is a, what's tool validation? Anybody know? You got good. Okay, it's it's that, but also you got to make sure you validate that tool. So once you take that tool out of the box, right, you got to make sure it functions that device functions as advertised. All right, so even every time you make a software upgrade, you got to revalidate the tool. You got to show that it is that specific tool works like it's supposed to work, and that's got to be documented. Use those forensic tools. You're probably going to pay three times as much because it's a forensic toilet seat, right? But if it's it, but if you've got to make sure you use the forensic standard tool. Um, but you've also got to know your limitations, which is just like Harry says. You've got to know your limitations. Nobody can know it all. Recognize those and reach out and get some help. If you're dealing with a situation or a system or some kind of technology that you're not familiar with, find somebody. Phone a friend. Get that lifeline. All right? Don't get in over your head. Resist that urge, and lawyers are the worst to, to, to poke it with a stick. They just know the evidence is on there, so I just turned that laptop on just for a minute. I just wanted to find that. Don't do that. That's like square dancing in the crime scene. All right, don't do that. All right, decision time. Early on, at some point, you may, you or your boss or whoever may make a decision as far as which way and how you want to handle this. Because obviously the forensic way is going to be more time consuming, more painstaking, more expensive, et cetera. So you may, there's a little bit of a decision there to be made. You may make that early on and then kind of toss all that to the side. Or you may go with caution and say, yeah, I want to make sure because when you hit that decision fork, okay, and you decide that, understand there's no going back to a large degree. You can't unring that bell. Once you do these things and they're already done, you can't go back and, and, and have a mulligan or a do-over on a lot of this. So make sure if you make that decision, make sure you're ready to live with the consequences. Question I get a lot or hear a lot is when do I call the cops? Great question. <clears throat> no easy answer. Great question. No easy answer. One of the things... I'd probably say that uh, the federal law enforcement is much better equipped to deal with these kinds of things than local and state at the moment. Very rarely will you be able to call 911 and have somebody respond on, on, a, on, a, on a massive uh, breach of your system. The, the guy hopping out of the cop car is going to have no clue. Uh, I would encourage you guys to reach out to the FBI or the Secret Service. They're the ones that handle a lot of this stuff. Talk to them. It honestly depends. Even the most smallest violation of a breach of your network can be a federal, is a federal offense. The question is, are they going to prosecute it? On the crack side, for example, that's one of the things I did a lot was, was uh, work crack cases in federal court. We, we arrested guys and charged them with having one rock of crack and took them to federal court and ultimately federal prison. All right. But that's because those, even they had a small amount because they were strategically important because those guys were the linchpin to much bigger fish. Is the reason they took them or they are a real bad actor and they had a lot of, uh, a bad history. So there's different motivations of why they would do that. So uh, it just depends is the best answer I've got for you. All right, real quick, some references and resources. Um, NIST, this uh, guide to integrating forensic techniques and incident response, great resource. It's free. Another one, if you want to know how to, about handling, if you got any questions about handling digital evidence, this is from the, this is actually from England, from the ACPO, the, uh, uh, the uh, Association of Chiefs of Police Officers out there and it's a free guide you can download and it's got some really up to the date they actually address that live system versus dead system response which a lot of our stuff does not yet uh been a shameless plug uh in Huntington we've got an organization called uh, the Appalachian Institute of Digital Evidence we have a conference there also it's usually in April and we have three different tracks we've got an information security track digital forensics track and an e-discovery track bringing a lot of good speakers uh, a lot of folks that are here will also be there uh, you won't find a better uh, bang for your buck, I don't think. So we encourage you guys to stop by and check us out. We're on Facebook and Twitter. Here's what we ran through. Do I have any questions? Really? Sure. Not about crack or hookers? <laughs> Nothing? All right. Well, there's my my digits. If you need something, if you need me for anything, I'll be happy to help you any way I can. Thank you guys for listening, and I've hit it. I'm about one minute for my limit. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Good, sir. How are you? <laughs>